Yeah, th thank you, Jeremy. That, that was a very kind in introduction. I don't know if this meandering, uh, uh, I don't know what it says about me and my life, but uh, it's working okay so far. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be in this beautiful city and this uh, gorgeous uh, uh, campus. I've been in Vancouver a number of times, and I always uh, enjoy it very much. Uh, so I, I wanted to talk about some of the work that I've been doing for the last few years uh, along the lines of something that we call dynamics of dyadic interactions. This is, um, my name is here, but, but there's a number of students and colleagues behind. And as is almost often the case, they, they deserve all the credit. Uh, uh, so I'm going to be speaking in, in their behalf here. I'm going to be describing some of the premises that underlie my work, and, and you may think that some of them are obvious, and you are right, but, but I find it helpful to use them as a reminder of where we stand, where are our biases, and where we're going with this. And, and I try to tell my students uh, this. And I'm going to be describing some of this work and some of the analytic approaches that we've been using uh, uh, to analyze uh, uh, the, our data. And I will give some, some examples. So the, the, the main two premises are one complexity, the other one variability. So there's nothing new here. There's, there's nothing new. We can dissect any of this in various ways, and I'm sure you could do this perhaps in a better way than, 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 than I do. Uh, to say that human dynamics are complex is, 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 a, is, is almost uh, uh, is an understatement of the, of the reality. But I focus on a number of pieces here. So, so for example, the aspect of the multifaceted, the multiple, we have multiple variables with multiple dimensions unfolding at different times. So we can think about development, and we can think about the physical aspect of it, the emotional aspect of it, the psychological aspect of it. And each of these pieces, although they are interrelated, each follows its own time course. And they don't necessarily overlap. They do match, their signatures match in the long run, but not at, at, at they, they don't necessarily have the same uh, uh, metric. The nested time scales and, and multicausality. These are notions that Linda Smith and uh, Esther uh, 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 Ellen have been talking for a, a, a long time. The idea of self-organization, how a system may have a number of parts that are, uh, without an external agent, they may assemble and organize themselves without a predetermined pattern without a predetermined pattern, and when you start in a given point, you may end up in different places. This is going to play a role in some of the analysis that I'm going to show later on. And of course, the variability. I worked with uh, one of my mentors, John Nesselrod, who was a very strong uh, proponent of variability. And this variability, we can think about variability within individuals and across individuals. Within individuals, we know that we don't respond in the same way across different situations. And even, even in a given situation, over time, we find important variability. And those patterns of variability, we think they may be important. They may carry some information that I think is important to capture. And of course, the variability across individuals, where we don't, we don't we, in many cases, we shouldn't assume the individuals are going to behave in the same way over time. And then complexity gets compounded by the fact that individuals will likely show different patterns of dynamics, each, each of them uniquely uh, uh, complex. OK, so, so a couple of other things. I'm going to, I would like to distinguish between models that are descriptive and models that are potentially informative about mechanisms. And uh, I, I would say that uh, for the purpose of prediction and all description modeling is good, but this may not be sufficient if the goal 
if the goal is to understand potential mechanisms that underlie the, the dynamics and, and, the, and the changes. And the understanding this, getting at this part, requires at least a couple of things. One, a collection of rich data that can represent, the, can represent that complexity and the time dependency and analytic approaches that can capture those dynamics, that can, they, they can capture the underlying process and, and these dynamics. And these mechanisms are typically hidden. So, so in most cases, we don't know what the data mechan a, a generator mechanism is. And uh, in a lot of instances, most models are not going to be sufficient, what I call here standard models may not be sufficient to extract information. So those, those are the, those are the, 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 the premises. Um, and I'm going to illustrate some of the work that I've been doing based on these premises. The, the last one that has to do with the variability is that, as we will see in a, in a, in a second from some empirical work, it may not be reasonable to pull all the individuals or all the units of analysis, whatever th those might be in our data, and, uh, and uh, to make inferences, because they may not represent a given individual or a given unit. Um, and what I've been doing most of the time is to uh, build a model from the individual uh, at the individual level and, and eventually trying to generate inferences that pertain to the population. This is all theoretical, but there are important uh, notions that define who we are, what, is the, what are the biases uh, behind our work. Okay, so let me describe the, the, the actual empirical work. A few years ago, we created uh, what we call the Dynamics of Dyadic Interactions Project. This was at UC Davis, where, where I am. And um, we wanted to recruit individuals in couples, and we wanted to know about their affective uh, uh, processes, their emotional experiences. Uh, so we created this, this website, and, um, and we created this, this email to, to recruit participants and to, and to communicate with them, dating at UC Davis. Well, of course, a lot of people thought that this was a dating service. And, and we had emails from people who were interested in being a dynamic relationship and things like that. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, I, I realized that that would, be, that would give me a better life financially, actually, than, than the work. But that's not what, well, that's not what we did. Um, so a couple, a couple of, uh, uh, um, of things. Um, the idea behind these dyadic interactions is that individuals in diets, as any two units in a, in, an, in, a, in a system, they are interrelated. Their thoughts, their behavior, their, their, their emotions are, beha uh, are interrelated such as the thoughts, uh, emotions, and behaviors of one person will influence, will be interrelated with those of the other individual. That's, that's the idea. And there's, there's uh, many work uh, in attachment theory, uh, uh, work in emotional co-regulation that uh, attest uh, uh, to that. So the theoretical part of that, the methodological part of that was that the way we were thinking about is if we were to develop models to capture information in dyadic interactions, we're going to need two components, at least two components. One that is going to tell me something about self-regulatory mechanism, how an individual changes uh, over time as a function of him or herself and co-regulatory mechanisms. And here I am thinking, I am trying to describe the interrelations between the two individuals. I know that the terminology about self-regulation, co-regulation ha can have different meanings. What I mean here is the within-person dynamics and the between-person uh, uh, dynamics. And this is the data collection that we, we designed we had 
couples to come together to, to my lab. And uh, the first visit, we uh, had them fill out a number of demographic questionnaires and uh, psychological uh, measures. And for some of them, we also collected some physiological data that I, I will describe in, in a little bit. Um, then we asked them to give us a daily report of their affect. This is simply a, a, a very uh, brief questionnaire about the emotional experiences. It has two parts. One is the panas, the about general affect, and another one is a set of adjectives that we uh, came up with to describe emotional experiences in the relationship every day for three months. So I said, and then uh, what we call the phase three, after one year, after one year, one year and two years after the initial visit, we contacted the, these couples and we wanted to know where, where, where were they in the relationship. We wanted to assess relationship stability and relationship quality. So as a consequence, we have data from uh, a little bit over 400 diets. Uh, who, uh, and then we have daily assessments from 52 to 182 uh, days. Uh, some, of the, the, some of the diets are students. This is before we had any funding to pay the participants. And then we, so about half of them are from, from students in the, in, at UC Davis. And the other half uh, is from individuals in the, in, the, in the community. So we go from about 20 to 74. And, and time in the relationship from, I just met you on my way to the lab. Um, <laughs> do you, are, you, are you interested in, in making some money? I'm, I need to go that. So we are in a relationship all of a sudden. Uh, and then all the way to, to uh, 35, 35 years. OK. Uh, and just briefly, the goals are to develop models for analyzing dynamics in dyadics, in, 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 uh, in dyadic systems. So if you have data along these lines, uh, you should think about your own research. And, and, and I, I think that should help you understand some of the ideas the, behind this. So we wanted to identify time-related patterns in this case of affective processes in the, in the couples in the context of romantic relationships. Uh, model self-regulation and co-regulation. And also, we wanted to know if once you extract these patterns of information, can they help you something? Can they help you, can they help you know or predict something about the system later on? That, that, that was an important uh, piece for them. OK, so this is a picture of almost all the data. And, and uh, well, you can, you can see what we mean by complexity. There's nothing apparent here other than a bunch of ups and downs. Here, um, the starting point for everybody is the first day. That may not be the best. I mean, we could shift things to start on a Monday or to start or as a function of the time in the year, well, uh, spring, summer, uh, uh, winter, and, and uh, et cetera. Uh, or we could shift this time series as a function of an important event. In this particular case, the, the description is just using the starting point. But the starting point may not be the most informative. Um, but, but more importantly, I, I think that it's just hard to extract anything. I mean, we could do some time series in the, in, the, in the frequency domain and get some models, but that's not what we wanted. So when we look at the time series for each couple, things become a little bit more clear. So we can still see complexity. And we can certainly see some variability. So variability within the diet, and this is not a flat line by any means. There's a bunch of ups and downs. Differences between the type of measure, this would be positive affect, this would be negative affect for the same diet. And certainly variability, I'm sorry, this would be positive, this would be negative for the same diet. And this would be positive affect for one diet and positive affect for a different diet. 
these are two other couples where the variability is even more apparent. So, so this variability sometimes is disregarded as noise. But it's possible that it carries some important information. It's possible that it's part of the signature of affect of these individuals. And if that is the case, that's what we want to capture. Uh, and the other piece is that you can see some sort of synchronicity or coherence, or without a technical term, the two lines seem to be together. And that may mean something. That may mean something. We don't know, but that may mean something. What, what, what it means in this case is that they're reporting very much along the same line. So it's possible that the emotion, emotional co uh, experiences are lined up in a particular way that can be, that can be informative. So the, the idea then was, well, how, how do we extract these patterns of information? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show three different approaches that we've used. There's no technicalities here. If somebody's interested, I'll be happy to, to try to answer the, the questions. The first one is what, what is called a dynamic factor analysis. And all it is is multivariate time series. Multivariate time series in which we are putting together factor analysis and time series. Uh, I'm going to assume that people know what factor analysis is. And uh, it, it, we can describe this in a different way. Imagine this is time that we have one factor for one individual in the couple. This is your affect, if you could describe it like that. This is your affect that is a Latin variable and is being measured by a number of measures how happy you are, how blue you are, how sad you are today in relation, to the rela in, in, in relation to the relationship. And this is your partner's affect, the affect of the other person in, in the couple, which is, which is also measured by the same variables. And this is a time t, this is a time t minus one, t minus two, all the way. So in our case, the time metric would be one day. Is that the best? Most likely not. But that's, that's, that's what we have. This is the way we represent it here. So what we're trying to get out with this approach is two things. One, what is the structure? What is the factor structure of affect for each individual? So what is the best representation of affect? What, how do variables cluster together? or hang out together, one. And two, what are the time-related patterns? So I can say the affect for me may be a function of my own affect the day before, maybe two days back, and that also of my partner, if that is the case. That's what we're trying to get. And any questions? By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm OK if people have questions and we we interrupt. Uh, I mean, I don't know what the formality is, but, but I'm happy to do that. Yes? So are you ruling out any kind of concurrency relationship Any kind of what? Concurrency relationship. Um, that is being modeled in the correlation of the residuals. So that goes at the same time. Correct. That's on the same day. That is, that is concurrent. That is correct. Yes, yes. Um, OK, so this is a busy table. Let me walk you through uh, it. By the way, this is all affect related to the relationship, okay? And this is, this is, these are the, what is called the factor loadings, which is how each variable is related to the factor. So we have positive affect for male, negative affect for male, positive affect for the female, negative affect for the female. So for example, if we look at here, we see the, 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 the variables that are representing positive affect more strongly for males. Committed, trusted, emotional, intimate, loved. For, for the, the females, would be very similar as well. Uh, emotionally intimate, loved, loving. We could say that feeling free does not really hang out with, with this factor. For them, uh, the same thing, free, social, but physically intimacy is not as strong as, as the other ones. 
Negative affect is mostly, or seem to be more, more, more strongly related to feeling blue. <laughs> Did I say something? Uh, I could tell you that, but, but, but it's, it would be hard to, to see without it. They'll be back up in a minute and a half. I'm not sure why. It's a, <laughs> it's a room malfunction. I, I can tell you something that happened, some of the things that happened in the study. So, um, so, so I mean, when you do a, a study like that, I mean, this is not a big project by any, by any means. <laughs> But because of the nature of the dating, we really had a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of issues. So for example, I, I received a letter, uh, a formal letter from uh, um, a gentleman who was saying, Professor Ferrer, thank you very much for your study. Uh, thanks to that, I discovered that my wife of 20, five years is having an affair with, with somebody. So, so we asked them to give us daily reports of the affect, but also to indicate if something had happened that day. And some people would say, well, I had to take my kid to the dentist. I had a chemistry exam. Some people went into excruciating detail about their sexual lives. <laughs> and I, I haven't read any of that, but my graduate students uh, were very amused. But, but, what, <laughs> but what happened is that um, so apparently the, this woman was being honest and she was reporting everything just as we indicated. And we asked them, of course, to do this in a confidential way uh, and, and to not reveal the information. And, and apparently he went and looked at her, uh, um, at her files. But, but and I, I, I mean, I didn't feel responsible for that. But that also, that also tells you that this uh, paper and pencil, that's what we use, may not be, may not be the best, and, and it has some, 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 some problems. Um, it should be coming, right? It's probably gonna be yeah, there's a question there. Thank you. <laughs> Just to keep things going. Good, good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was about, about, 17, 18% 17, were married. Uh, oh, I don't remember exactly, but there, there was a decent percentage. I mean, once we started sample from the community, and 50% of the sample is, is from the community, you have the typical, I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of cohabitating couples. Uh, they have been together for a long time. And uh, these are from Davis. Uh, which is the, the town where UC Davis is one of the campuses of the UC Davis, and also adjacent areas such as Sacramento, and, uh, and Sacramento gives you a more diverse. But these are healthy couples, emotionally healthy couples, which is not good for this, because one of the things that we wanted to be able is to predict who would break up. You can have the most powerful models, but if there, nobody breaks up, you cannot detect anything. Uh, and among the, among, the college, uh, among the college students, the, the, the parents are the, 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 the expect. I mean, some people just met, some people. We had a woman who came to the study three times with three different <laughs> partners. Uh, so she was excluded from the analysis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I can tell you right now, I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> we did not disregard anybody on that account. Yeah. We do have the information, but I, uh, we do have the information whether you, who, who is living with you at home whether you have children or of your own or, or, or adopted or stepchildren, but we haven't used those in, in the analysis. Uh, so I, I don't remember, so I don't know if there would be enough to start making distinctions uh, of that finer uh, um, grade. Yeah. Okay, so, so this, this is the factor structure. Remember, this is 
the composition of what we can think of the latent variable affect. This, um, they are in matrices, but I'll just explain. So, so it, it, it should be straightforward. The numbers in blue represent the time effect of affect from one day to the next. So this is the how much positive affect for males is a function of itself the day before, negative affect it's from itself the day before, positive affect and negative affect for the females. So what we see is that they are okay. Positive affect seems to have a stronger Compo time component, negative affect seems to be a little bit of a weaker signal, and by the second day, they tend to dissipate. So that's one thing. Two, according to this, there's not much in the way of influences from one person to the other in the relationship, in the couple. So for example, this would be this negative point, the, the one at the bottom would be the influence of him on her negative affect, of his positive affect on her negative affect the day after, and is very small. But these are aggregate results. These are results that we obtain when we pull everybody together. So what we're representing here is the average couple. If we, I'm gonna skip this one, if we look at the same analysis that we take every diet separately, we run the analysis for each diet separately, and we get the parameters for each couple, and then we build the distributions, this is what we, what we see. We see a lot of variability in those effects. So a, a, if everybody had the same effects, the, this would be a flat line. But what we see is that the, it goes all over the place. And we can quantify that. For example, the effects of positive affect, the autoregressive effects, from himself to himself the day after, the average is 0.5, but there's a lot of variability. For some people, it's negative. For some people, it's very large. And the effect, say, of his negative affect on her positive affect, for some people is very, very is large and negative, and for some people is large and positive. So what we see is a completely different picture, is that there are important uh, individual differences. Individual differences, I mean diet differences in this case. And when we're looking at the patterns of interrelations in affect between the two individuals, now, at the individual level, we see some non-trivial effects that they were obscured before. So but modeling the dynamics for all couples at once, this is what we could describe as the average couple, it does not appear to be reasonable. It's going to obscure the idiosyncrasies. It's going to obscure to the extent that, that diets have their unique signatures, that's going to be uh, obscure. And it's going to uh, assume that everybody has the same similar patterns of variability in, in dynamics. And that the other methodological components here that I'm happy to discuss as well. But, one of, but, but another point is that these models are, are to some extent very descriptive. I am trying to understand what is the best structure of affect. There's not a theoretical model that we're trying to uh, 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 evaluate here. So that, that's, that was the second step that we took. Other models that are developed for dyadic interactions that can inform us about these processes. And the first one that we, we, we used is a model that comes from sociology by Diane Family and David uh, Grimberg. <laughs> Um, and it's a model that is expressed as a system of differential equations. And what that is, is that we have two units in the system. Let's say that the first one, x, is for her, and the y is for, for him. And what we're saying is that the changes in a given process, in, in our example, in our context, these are the emotional changes on a daily basis are going to be a function of two components. 
one component that has to do with herself, this is just X, and another component that has to do with the relation between her and him. And we're going to use, we want to quantify this with two parameters. So I'm going to call this first parameter the, the self-regulation parameter or the parameter that tells me how she changes with relation to herself. And the second parameter, how she changes in relation to her partner's affect. And the same thing for him. And the, the only thing that, 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 that I need to describe here is this X star and Y star. That is defined as an ideal type of, in this case, emotion. So that could be some emotional set point. It could be some homeostatic uh, 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 balance affect that you're trying to maintain. And the minute that you exceed, you need to go back. It's almost like a thermostat, right? That, you, that you're trying to regulate that. So the, the, the closer you are at any given time from that, this parameter is going to bring you back. And the same thing, the, the, the further away you are from your partner, that, that parameter is going to tell me the extent to which you are being brought back. Yeah? Is that defined by just the person's average? That is a very good question. We've tried in various different ways. We've tried, for example, to have the average as the set point. We've also tried to uh, have a, what we borrowing from the clinical literature, what we call what we what, what is described as a healthy proportional affect, which is if you if you scale the positive affect in relation to positive and negative, ratios of about 0.7 and above are considered to be healthy. Uh, so we've tried different approaches. We've also tried to estimate that from the data. And as it turns out, it all came back to about 0 0.7, 0 0.8, somewhere over there. Yeah. But you, you might have other uh, knowledge that can inform uh, uh, what should go there. Does that, does that make sense? Um, OK, so, so the, the, the analysis that I'm going to show um, uh, from the data in which we did this proportional affect positive in relation to all affect. So, so a ratios, high ratios are going to indicate the positive is much higher than, than, the, than the negative. Um, and one more thing about this model, this is a very simple deterministic model, and I'm happy to explain if you're curious what, what, what this means and the implications. But in spite of its simplicity, it can generate very different types of behavior. So for example, if you have positive parameters here both, you can have some type of cooperative behavior. Whereas no matter where you start, eventually you may converge. You could have, uh, if you remove the, the, the co-regulation parameters, meaning if there's no way that your changes in emotions are related to those of your partner, and the same thing is true for your partner, you could have two independent individuals in the diet. And then, well, he's going to follow his own path, she's going to follow her own path. And then you could have different variations of that. One dependent, one codependent, the other way around, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, in spite of being a very simple model, it, it can lead to very different types of nonlinear uh, uh, types of behavior. This is the uh, table of results once we analyze the data, again, separately for each, per, for each diet, and we build the, the empirical distributions. So what we have is a strong self-regulation component for her, for him, and a little bit weaker co-regulation component. So, so these numbers meaning that for her, the further away she's going from her ideal emotional set, that parameter is going to bring her, her back more strongly. That would be the case too with that of her male partner. But, and I'm, I'm saying male, female, because these are all heterosexual couples. It just happened that, that, that way. 
uh, and the same thing for, 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 for him. So a strong uh, uh, within person self-regulation component and a little bit weaker, uh, a little much weaker, I should say, uh, uh, um, um, uh, co-regulation. Well, we, we also try to say, given, given that we can set constraints on these parameters, can we classify the types of behavior of these diets based on this typology? So how many of them are independent? How many of them are codependent? Oh, interdependent is better, is better than codependent. Codependent sounds a little bit like a, a, a drug addiction, which may be true, but, but that's not what we mean here, and, and, et cetera. And, and you, can do, you can do this. You can evaluate this hypothesis, and then you can use a number of rules uh, to model selection. It can be based on fit. It can be based on model prediction, and that's, you can use different, different criteria. In our sample, most of them were interdependent and independent. Um, and this is something that should make us think about, uh, that you don't really know how much of the fact that most of them are in the interdependent or independent, is it because it's true in the population? Is it because our measures are really, really crappy? I mean, after all, I'm asking, how do you feel today about that? I mean, who knows, right, what goes on? In spite of that, we've been able to get a, a strong single, a, a strong uh, 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 signal enough to, to detect these, these patterns. But we don't know, and the time series here are relatively short. 90 data points is, is really, really uh, uh, small for, for these types of, of models. You can plot the predictions based on the model. So based on the, on the, the, the model here, we have female dependent. These are all female dependent. These are all male dependent. And yet we see differences. Differences even within the typology and, and, uh, and differences between the typology. And the patterns, may, the differences in the patterns may not be different. But what we know is that these are generated by very different mechanisms. That we know by very different mechanisms in, in the model. Okay, we've, uh, we've used a, a number of other uh, uh, models. Some of them come from different types of literature, developmental literature, uh, uh, clinical psychology, like the, 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 the work by John Gottman, and, and also some, some, uh, some models from population biology. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I, I'm, I'll be happy to, to give you some references as well. Um, and we've been struggling a little bit with the idea of model selection. How do you select among these models? This is a little bit more of a technical work, and I'm happy to, to, to discuss with you some of it as well. But I wanted to talk a little bit at the, the, last, the last part. Um, I wanted to, to tell you one finding about the physiology, and I want to then talk about some of exploratory approaches. So. Um, very briefly, so at the beginning, some of the couples, when they came to the lab, we just hooked them up to the, some physiological signals, and I'm just going to talk about uh, um, uh, uh, respiration and heart rate. And they did a number of tasks, uh, what we call a baseline, where they were blindfolded and they, they, they were supposed to breathe uh, normally and to not touch each other or talk to each other. Then we ask them to, we ask them to stare at each other's eyes for three minutes, and that doesn't kill anybody, right? But but it but it raises, uh, in some people raises something. And then the idea was, that, that what we were had in, what we had in mind is, can people synchronize when they are in a, re in a relationship? Then so then we ask them directly, can you synchronize? Can you imitate? That's the only. That's the only, the, the only uh, 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 instruction that, that, that we gave. Um, and then we, we looked at different things, but I just want to uh, tell you about a, a, a result. So we 
applied exactly the same models that I just described to the physiology. Okay, the same the differential equation models that applied to the physiology. And then we looked at the association, the correlation of the parameters from the day-to-day -day emotions correlated with the parameters about the physiology, right? That's, that's what, we, what we're looking at. And here we have for heart rate and daily affect, and here we have respiration and daily affect. And what we find in is that the parameters that represent how females change their day-to-day -day emotional experience or report the uh, emotional experiences as a function of that of their male partners is highly correlated with how they change both their heart rate and their respiration during this task of imitation. That is not true for males. That is not true for males. Uh, for males, that is, uh, uh, is not different from zero. And, and we've done a number of uh, techniques to make sure that this is not just chance, uh, uh, and we cannot reject, uh, uh, I mean, we cannot, we, we cannot retain the null hypothesis that it is by chance. So what it means, again, is that, is that there seems to be, according to this model, a, 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 an association in the mechanisms by which they, females, uh, change the day-to-day -day emotional experiences and their <coughs> millisecond to millisecond physiology in response to that of, of their, of their uh, partners. Yeah. Physiology. Can you imitate your partner's physiology? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's all. Yeah. And, and as it turns out, uh, when you ask most of them, what they do is they try to imitate their respiration. Right? I mean, I cannot look into your heart and see how it goes. But, but, but maybe the pattern, uh, the breathing pattern can be, uh, uh, is, is something that is evident. So, so here the question is, can the dynamics of dyadic interaction, <coughs> as represented by this model, of course, and this represented by this model, be intrinsic to the, di to the diet, and, and thus that can be revealed through different types of data that have different time scales, different signature, different metrics. So is it something that we may carry? And, and under some conditions, you may, you may reveal it. That, that's a question, and I don't have an answer to that. So I, I am struggling with that, and I'm thinking about that. Uh, so I'll, I'll appreciate if you, if you uh, have comments along those lines. OK, let me uh, uh, talk to the last piece. Well, the, 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 what I wanted to say also is that these, these you know how the press takes sometimes things that you say and they spin it in a, in a way. And sometimes it's good. So this was reported in Science Daily and the Huffington Post. So that's good. But then it got reported. I mean, look at the two cupcakes. So I was trying to be sophisticated and rigorous in the analysis. And they just have two cupcakes here. And then it got worse <laughs> by that. And now every time that. Valentine's Day approaches, Professor Ferrer, you're an expert in love and, re and I said, no, I can barely keep my own relationship going. So, <laughs> but it doesn't matter, you, you, I mean, I'm, I'm, anyhow, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so, so the last thing that I wanted to, that, that I wanted to describe is um, a, a, a different set of techniques that we've been applying and, and again, I keep saying we because this is my work with, with, with mostly students, um, which is based on the idea that, that we are finding very large differences across diets. And, uh, and, and to me, that speaks more and more to the fact that we, we shouldn't aggregate unless we have a very good reason that each diet should be analyzed separately. And the other one is that we really don't know the mechanisms, that, that, the mechanisms that generate the data. And what, what, what I mean by that is we think about the day-to-day -day, uh, changes in emotions. There may be a thousand things going on. And any model is going to be uh, 
a, a simplification by necessity. So what about if we apply approaches that are not constrained by any model? And this is one of the, the things that we've been doing lately. In a way, is, is to, to, to have some sort of different lenses that you move throughout the data, trying to capture some uh, things that are apparent or some things that are rare, but they may be important. Okay, so let me describe both. Um, the first one that we did is, is, is simply a, a, an adaptation of some work in the eye track uh, uh, research, the uh, fixation uh, uh, research. And here, if you can think of this, if you believe that affect can be put in two dimensions, positive and negative, so this would be low, this would be high, high, low. So if you high and positive affect and low and negative affect, this presumably is a good thing, right? I mean, everything is beautiful, etc. If you hear, this may not be so good. Not only that, how do you move from one to the next? How do you move throughout the days? Is there a particular pattern that we can extract? Does it have any meaning? So what we did is that we, we, we looked at these uh, transitions. In what, my, in what my student, this was Joel, still called a sperm plot. So this is a, my affect today, and the tail is where was it yesterday. This is her affect today, and where was it yesterday. And what we did is we uh, looked at, let me see if I can get it here how they move from one day to the next. And uh, we see that they hang out a lot here. They seem to be together quite a bit, but they also make very large transitions. And very large transitions along this diagonal, it may not be a good thing. So what we did is that we created this uh, 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 visualization for each diet. This is why you have graduate students. <laughs> and then the idea was to, to quantify these patterns. Well, in order to quantify these patterns, you, you get the idea. In order to quantify these patterns, we came up with, the, with the, the, an adaptation of this fixation algorithm based on two parameters. So say that this is your affect today. Then the next day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, etc., And you're going to be moving on and on and on. So if from one day to the next, you don't move more than a certain amount that needs to be, needs to be determined, and if that is true for at least three days, we, we determine that as well, we're going to call this a period of relative stability. Yeah, that's, that, that's all. Those are the only two things. So then here we have the from the from day, uh, three, four, and five, there wasn't a lot of movement. Okay, so that's a period, these three days. And then from the fifth to the sixth day, there was a big jump. So that breaks the cycle, and then we start, the algorithm starts counting again. So in this sequence of 12 days, there would be two periods of relative stability, one of three days and the other one of four days. And they are not located exactly in the same way, because it may not be the same if they are located in low positive affect than in high positive affect. So then we plotted these patterns this way in, in what, again, my, my student called poker chip plots. And here what we have is in blue, the periods of stability for him, in red, the periods of stability for her. So we looked at where are they located, how long do they, la do they last, and the extent to which they overlap. So for example, here the overlap is almost perfect, right? And they are high positive affect, low negative affect, so this, this should be good. This couple, they're in the 70s. They should know by now, right? Well, this is not as good. I mean, it's actually, I shouldn't say that, it's pretty good. But that's not the case for a lot of the couples. So is this good? Is this bad? How can we quantify that? 
Well, the way we quantify that is, if we use these patterns, can they predict where the system is going to be one or two years later? I mean, is this indicative of breaking up? Of course, you need to think about we need to have enough couples to break up, et cetera, et cetera. And it's an indicative of relationship stability. So these are some of the, the things that we, that we measure from that. In the number of fixation periods are for the individual, the duration, the variability, and the location. And the same thing for the overlaps. How many times your periods of sta emotional stability overlap with those of your partner? How long did they last? There was the variability and where they were located. And then we looked at whether or not they were related to, 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 the, to the future. The future, uh, the, future uh, the future is not what it used to be. The future here is simply one year later, uh, reports of whether they're, they're, the couple is staying together or not. This is simply the result of a logistic model where we predict and staying together. And that some, of the, some of the findings are intuitive, some of, some of them are not. For example, we find them that the length, at the individual level, the length of periods of relative stability, those who report or those who show longer periods are more likely to stay together. Uh, those who report high levels of affect, oh, the variability is that significant. So positive affect is, is, is uh, 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 more related to breakup. So there may be some suppression effects here. So there's some findings that are not entirely uh, are clear. The patterns for the overlap are a little bit better. So here we find in that uh, the length of the, of the overlap. So the longer your periods of stability overlap with those of your partner, the more likely to stay together. But if there is variability in that, that's related to, to breaking up. And then variability in positive affect is also related to break up and high levels of negative affect is, 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 is related to breakup. High levels of negative affect, meaning that you are both in a period of emotional stability in areas of negative affect. Well, if you're pissed all day for, you know, uh, for long, that cannot be really, really, really good. Um, so, so we found this very interesting. Then we look at, well, can we make the same types of predictions with more psychological variables? where we use age in the relationship, I'm sorry, age, time in the relationship, uh, 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 attachment-related avoidance and anxiety, satisfaction in the relationship, balance, so I do the dishes, you do the cooking, etc. cetera, uh, consensus, equity, and alternatives. The only variable of those that was related to uh, uh, staying together, breaking up, was, was a relationship uh, satisfaction, none of the others. So, so we, we thought, well, in spite of this data being so fragile, uh, we are getting enough of a, sing, of a, of a uh, um, signal to make these predictions. We're talking about you reporting day to day, and then you reflect on the day, and you give me a two and a three, and then one year later, and two, year late, uh, two years later, we ask you, and, and you say, well, we're still together, we break up, and, and yet, you can detect that. I, I found that uh, rather powerful. Then uh, we did a number of uh, uh, um, calculations to see what would be the optimal number of days that you should count in order to say this is a period of relative stability. Because we started with three, but it could be four, it could be five, it could be eight. Of course, the longer the period, the more restricted you are. And you could make it all the way to one. If you make it all the way to one, one every day is a, is a period. And then the other thing that we vary was, instead of saying you cannot move from more than one unit, that's going to depend on the scale. Our scale was from one to five. So, so we wanted to know what are the optimal parameters for the duration and the, 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 the dispersion. And uh, as it turns out, 
uh, we will ride along the money. But this is not surprising because the scale is from one to five, so it has to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, with the three, I think we were a little bit lucky, but, but it was somewhere between three and, and, and four days. Okay, the last thing that, that we're doing now is instead of looking at these patterns of movement, why don't we focus on aspects that we think may be important? And what we call important is something that we, we call the red zone. So these are, these are areas where you have low positive affect and high negative affect. The idea, if you think about some sort of a, a, a limit cycle in dynamics, so what happens when you, when you dig yourself into a hole? That's, that's what we're talking about here. Um, so what, what, what is it that makes people go into this hole in the, in the, in, when we think about the, the, the relationship? And more important, what are the strategies that people use to get out? So does he get out by himself? Does she go in with him and both come out? And, and can we associate those patterns with the strategies? So what we're looking now is we are dismissing most of the data and we're focusing on these small regions of the, of the distribution. So here the idea would be to, to th this could be in a lot of analysis these are very small areas in the distribution that we disregard. Here, this is what we focus on. If that's what we think can be important. I mean, a, a lot of the work by Gottman, Levinson, uh, uh, describe these, these, I mean, some couples who are in such a state that just a little push get them going, and it's really hard to break down that cycle. Well, they would fall in there. So we define the, this uh, red zone uh, um, as a function of the distribution of, the, of the, the scores for each individual separately. That means that we are going, by definition, say that everybody has a red zone. And that may not be the same across individuals. That's an assumption, and it has its, its complications as well. So then what we, uh, what we wanted to know is how many times does one person go into the red zone? How big is the jump? Do I jump from here to here? Do I jump from here to here? And how do I get out? And, and where is my partner before I go in and how I get out? Uh, and we, we're still finalizing this, this, this analysis, but uh, some general patterns that we find in. At the individual level, jumps into the red zone are larger than those coming out. So, so maybe you just have a, a, a blowout, and then you just go in, and then you just come out very, very uh, 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 carefully because you're scared or because who knows. The more vertical the angle of entry, the gain in negative affect, the bigger the jump into the red zone. So these are at the individual level. At the couple level, the greater the distance between partners before, the bigger the jump. So the more apart they are in the affect before the, before the red zone, the bigger the, the, the bigger the jump. The greater the distance during the red zone, so the more apart they are emotionally, the smaller the jump out. This Things, I mean, these partners make sense. And partners are closer after exiting the red zone than upon entering. Then the last thing we looked at, these partners in relation to predictions of uh, 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 relationship satisfaction. And what we find is the large jumps into the red zone are negatively related to relationship satisfaction. And this distance, the distance, the emotional distance between the partners is also related to, uh, negatively related to uh, relationship satisfaction. Okay, so let me, let me summarize um, and, um, and conclude and then we can open these two, two, two questions. One thing that I would say is that these extracted patterns of daily fluctuations in emotions carry important information about the, about the affect 
and about the daily dynamics in affect. Uh, but not only that, the, in, in addition to this, to this descriptive uh, information, they can help us make predictions about the, the future, which I think that this, this gives, this validity give, give, uh, gives important weight to these patterns. And um, I, I am very much in favor of these exploratory, mo exploratory models that can capture unique aspects. So these are idiosyncrasies, these are unique signatures, and uh, maybe because they are not constrained by any rules. The models are not constrained by any rules. They are not imposed. Uh, uh, what we focus you know, is, is just on data. And, and I think that there should be a little bit more of an interplay between these two types of approaches, the mathematical and statistical approaches and the model evaluation and the, and the exploratory models. And, and maybe a good sequence is to have a phase of exploration and, and discovery and then followed by uh, uh, replication and confirmation. I, I think that's the, that's the way to go. And I think that's, uh, I would like to see more of that. Sometimes we have very strong theories, very strong hypotheses. Sometimes we don't. And I think a combination of the two uh, would be an ideal way to go. Thank you very much. <laughs>